As you guys are very aware, we are big fans of the 300 blackout cartridge here at T-Rex Arms. We've published a number of videos here on YouTube with the Sig Rattler, uh, my quietest 300 blackout gun, which actually may not be the quietest anymore, uh, which was a nine inch BCM. And we've just produced a lot of content around 300 blackout. And the reason we really enjoy 300 blackout and we think it's a very viable caliber is it allows you to get a very effective lethality out of short barrels. Uh, so instead of you know taking a 5.56 you know round and trying to drop down below a 10.3 barrel, uh, and you know you start having a gun that's not eh, super great like a 7.5, um, this cartridge allows you to go all the way down to like 4.75 and still achieve a level of lethality. So 300 blackout as far as a backpack gun, a truck gun, um, a PDW, whatever you want to call it, uh, happens to be uh, one of the more effective cartridges on the market if you are looking for that small bag gun. Now, the problem with 300 Blackout that you guys are going to say, and you're looking at the title and wondering, budget 300 Blackout, this is impossible, is the ammo is fairly expensive. It's like 80 cents around. It's going to be fluctuating based on the time this video is published. Um, but over the years, 300 Blackout has become much more common with uh, Wolf starting to make 300 Blackout ammo and lots of other uh, companies that are making you know different kinds, subsonic, supersonic, uh, FMJ, and then fancy uh, defensive loads. Um, so there is a lot of disparity in the price for the ammo, depending on which you're getting. Um, and there's a lot of good options out there. So it really is a, a main uh, mainstay ammo at this point uh, based on Wolf making the ammo for it. Uh, it's not one of these like weird calibers that's coming out, you know, in the last five years. It's been around for a while now and I think it's here to stay. So the question with 300 Blackout, if you are interested in getting into one is, how cheap can you go? And I know there's some, some, some confusion because 300 Blackout is sort of that Gucci caliber round. And so it has that sort of connotation going with it. But then you have companies like PSA that make a $300 upper with bolt carrier group. So for under $500, I can build a 300 blackout caliber rifle that shoots this Gucci round. So that's kind of a head scratcher, you know, for some people. And uh, it's kind of been a head scratcher for me a little bit because I've mainly shot, you know, higher end 300 blackouts over the years. But during Black Friday, I was doing some, you know, snooping around. I was looking at sales and just seeing what companies were doing. And uh, I noticed on PSA's website, they had uh, this little upper for $300, which I thought was a Black Friday discount. Turns out it's not, it's always $300. But I was a little intrigued because it looked like I could buy a 300 blackout rifle for around $500 and then go out and see just how good it is compared to my BCM, our MCXs, our Rattler, you know, everything like that. So I decided I'm gonna piece together a budget honey badger. I'm gonna see how cheap I can go building a suppressed 300 blackout bag gun, truck gun, and just see how good this is compared to all these other guns that I've shot over the years. So what we have is the PSA upper, that's around $300. Um, I think it was like 320 on the invoice, but they're 300 right now, we just checked. Uh, an arrow lower receiver, because we use those on most guns here, great little lower, it was like $90. The lower parts kit I bought at PSA at the same time was, I want to say $80, so nice. So that's what, where it's like 490 for the whole gun, without sights, without anything, but that's okay. You know for now. Um, I got a retracting PDW stock. This was a little bit more expensive. Honestly, I could skip this and save a bunch of money, but for that honey badger, you know, feel and look, um, I wanted to run one of these. This was 375, so a little bit more, but obviously we could chuck that, just run a stock and, you know, be a lot cheaper. Um, for the suppressor, and the rail, because we want to go with that integral suppressor look. Um, Griffin Armament was the suppressor that I selected. And the reason for this is you're thinking, hey, you could have used a more budget suppressor, a YHM, you know, or such and such 3D printed can, or there's all kinds of like budget cans on the market right now. They're like 300 or so dollars. But if you think about it, if you are, you know, filing all the paperwork for a suppressor and you're putting it on a trust or you're doing a, a personal, uh, you know, you're, you're doing it all personal or whatever, and you're waiting a year for it, do you really want to spend $300 on that serialized item that's tied to you that you're also waiting a year on? In my opinion, that does, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If I'm gonna go through all of that trouble, I wanna go through that trouble with a piece of equipment that's a little bit nicer. So Griffin, I'm not saying that they're a, a mid-tier or, or even a, a budget can offering, but it's $575 as a direct thread th uh, 30 caliber suppressor. And I saw, looked at that and was like, yeah, Griffin's probably about as low as I'll go on a suppressor. Let's try one of those. We've got one of some of their uh, A2 birdcage suppressors here in the armory. 
I've liked how those performed. We don't have some of their higher end cans, but uh, I thought, hey, let's get this one, try it out. And Griffin has a nice little rail that it can sit underneath to give it that sort of honey badger look um, or that MP5 SD look. So I thought, let's give that a shot. And that rail was $90. So the entire build right here that we have without optics and lights and lasers and all that, because we're gonna keep that separate for this video. We're just gonna focus on the gun and actually you know, shooting the gun um, is $1,500. Um, which is about half the price of a Q Honey Badger, um, or actually a little less than half. Uh, so it's fairly affordable, fairly easy to get into. The suppressor does eat up a lot of that. None of that money includes tax stamps. And uh, we're not going to talk too much about that because uh, repeal the NFA. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to build the gun out. Um, I'm gonna, Josh is gonna build out the lower with all the, with the lower parts kit. I'm gonna work on the optic light setup on the rifle and we're gonna talk about just the size of this, uh, ray, this uh, upper and some things that go into building it out because it is pretty short, pretty small and there's some things you need to take into consideration for that. So let's uh, get to building. So this is humorous. I mean, it makes sense. They have a box they can fit a 16 inch upper in and they have this tiny little thing, seven inch barrel, tiny little M lock, comes with the bolt carrier group and a standard charging handle for 300 bucks, which uh, almost too good to, to believe. So let's talk about the upper a little bit. Um, I already looked at this uh, when we got it and there were a couple things that uh, kind of noticed right off the bat that are problematic uh, specifically with how fat this barrel is being a 300 blackout barrel and just how chonky it is um, cutie sl slot in the uh, rear which you will you know a lot of people would think like oh this is great it's got a cutie uh, slot or, or hole so I don't have to it saves money I don't have to buy a mount um, not gonna work with any standard QD because it is too close to this chonky barrel um, so the QD will not actually interface uh, and allow the little uh, detents to actually engage. So gonna have to add a, a mount to this and uh, it's probably not gonna be m lock because that's where my hand is gonna go. So I'm gonna have to do something on the top of the rail uh, to actually uh, equip a sling. So that is something to take into consideration. The other thing that I noticed is where the gas block uh, sits, and it makes sense, this is a short barrel, the bottom m lock slot is completely unusable, at least for most m lock attachments. And I believe everyone is using the same, they come from Magpul, that's how they make their money, it's selling m lock stuff. Um, you could get the little screws and the little nuts uh, from Magpul, and they are, I think they come in a couple different lengths, or it's one, or actually no, it's probably just one length for m lock, and it is too long for uh, it to work, it's gonna be pressing up against the gas block and you don't want that to happen. So on a, bar a barrel of this short, uh, I would like to have a vert grip to just help um, really you know, keep my hand in the same spot, be that reference point, but that is not going to be an option uh, with this m lock slot right here. So that kind of sucks. Um, the two side m lock slots are still usable for a white light. Um, there is enough uh, depth and distance so you can attach a Surefire or something like that. Um, but just a couple things to take into mind. So what we're gonna do is we're going to use a budget red dot. Uh, I don't have hollow suns and stuff in here. I know you guys would probably be thinking that would be more suitable for this and you're not wrong. Um, but I do have a Aimpoint RDS. <clears throat> this is the uh, micro offering they came out with uh, last year that is sort of in that budget realm, at least for Aimpoint. It's like $480. Um, so it gets you into you know, in the Aimpoint brand for not you know $700 for like a T2 or something like that. So we're gonna run that <clears throat> as our optic, our first optic. We have an Arasaka uh, sling mount that we're gonna use uh, here on the upper, close to the upper receiver. So I can run a sling because slings are the, uh, they keep the gun to you, very important. Now I'm not gonna be running iron sights on this build simply because I do have an aim point. So the battery life and the reliability is going to be perfect. Uh, well, not perfect, but you know, really good. But uh, if I were running iron sights, there's a couple options. Uh, the new Imbus uh, 3 whatever's, Imbus 3 Pros uh, polymer have come out. Um, I think they are like $120 for a set though. So for the same price, you could get a set of Daniels, which are fixed metal, very reliable, been around for a long time. And there's a couple different cool things you can do. 
If you are running uh, fixed iron sights like these, if you want to save a little bit of coin, which on this type of build you might want to, uh, when it comes down to uh, putting the weapon light on the rifle, you might actually want to do a pistol light at 12 o'clock. Um, you can even run your uh, iron sight here in the back, articulate the switches on either side of the gun, whether you're a righty or a lefty, uh, pretty easily. That is something that I see people doing. Um, it also keeps the rifle pretty streamlined for bag use. Uh, so that's one option. We're not going to do that though. Um, but that is one option if we wanted to run irons and kind of do something a little uh, wonky. Instead, we're going to be using a Surefire Pro Light because I could set it up in a way that's going to prevent me from overshooting the rail. And uh, I'll show you guys what that looks like. So we've got the first batch of accessories on and uh, what I figured out because uh, I was kind of messing with this a little bit earlier uh, was this setup for the light is going is my preferred uh, just because the light is still accessible once this is on a lower and I'm actually using it like a you know a gun um, but the light is also preventing me from overshooting uh, past the uh, rail uh, in front of the barrel um, and it keeps the light switch uh, pretty intuitive I'm not running a tape switch or anything like that. So the Surefire Pro Light being able to mount in the front and then it can swivel over to uh, any angle that I really need it to uh, is very effective. Now this is obviously not a budget part. It's a little bit more pricey. Um, so that is something to take into consideration, but I didn't really want to put an IED on this. So I'm um, gonna run Surefire. Um, honestly, Streamlight's another good option, um, but I like that the Pro Light, I can articulate this uh, for this particular build uh, to give me what I need and also make the gun a little bit more safe because I can't put a hand stop on here. I would like to, um, or a grip, but that's just not going to work uh, with M-Lock. Uh, for something like this, I would prefer having a quad rail. This is where a quad rail actually makes a lot of sense uh, because then all you can use all four sides for a grip. Uh, in some cases, running the laser on the side might actually be better on a build like this, and um, it would just give you a lot more options. So I would prefer if this came with a quad rail, um, just so you could actually utilize all the different uh, places. But, um, but you know, it is what it is, and I don't think they make a quad rail as short. I know some companies do, but I don't think PSA does. So this is the first build. We're going to be shooting it unsuppressed uh, to see how this rifle functions, because that is something worth uh, testing. And for you guys, uh, as a consumer, you're probably buying this way before you have the suppressor. You're probably going out to shoot it because you don't want to, you know, not shoot it until you get the can. Uh, so we're going to make sure that this can run unsuppressed before we build out the Honey Badger configuration with the extended uh, rail, the S, you know, with the suppressor underneath to see how this runs and see how rowdy it is. And it's going to be rowdy. So we've got the lower built, we've got the stock applied, and this thing is kind of hot actually. Now one thing to keep in mind, we've gotten a couple of these uh, tan arrow lowers, and we've always noticed that the coating, however they're doing it, whether it's anodized and Cerakote on top, or it's just a really generous coat of Cerakote, um, does make installing all the lower, the lower parts kit a little bit tougher. The mag release is not great from the lower parts kit of the PSA in this uh, particular lower. It's very, it's catching um, the, t again, tolerance stacking and all of that. Um, not as refined as a gun that's been QC'd uh, with parts, you know, they assemble it and QC it and make sure everything's good to go. Um, so that is one thing, but everything seems to be working. Uh, the big one's gonna be seeing if the, the gassing of the gun, and we're gonna have to play with it a little bit and try to tune it, uh, with this particular stock is going to work because when you're running PDW stocks, they're running uh, proprietary uh, buffers, and so unsuppressed this might be fine but running this stock with a suppressor with this particular spring buffer combo may not actually work super well we don't know yet we're gonna have to go test it and try it out uh, but I want to check something real quick so with the stock collapsed it actually collapses up here at the top again it's a sort of a tight button but that's good um, gun is tiny very short I have the sig rattler here so kind of the premium Gucci shorty option. Now this is a shorter barrel, uh, so a, a better test would be taking my 675 MCX setting up here and seeing how the lengths compare. Uh, but even with this particular gun with the shorter barrel stock collapsed, the PSA is only like two inches longer. Like this will fit most bags. Um, it is under that 20, four inch length of like a 10.3 with a law folder um, that it can fit in a lot of bags. So we do have that uh, really nice small form factor. It's pretty close to a Rattler. Um, but again, this is like a 475 barrel. Uh, this is a seven inch barrel. So it's like, eh, you know, not quite the exact, you know, same, but uh, yeah, that's pretty impressive how small it gets. So, and then we'll throw a sling on there. Uh, this MVP, uh, what's it called? The MVP 
Uh, Arc X stock does have a QD slot here in the rear, which is great because once you've attached this, you obviously want, aren't gonna have a, um, a lower receiver QD end plate. So sling from here to here and we are good to go. So let's go get it zeroed, play around and see what we can do with this. And then we will be shooting it in the uh, suppressed uh, with the Griffin can, uh, with the SD rail, and then see how that functions. And we'll switch up the optics a little bit. So we're at the range, we've got the gun built, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to shoot this gun as much as possible in one day into the evening. And our uh, target round count that we're going for is 2,000 rounds. We've got 1,000 rounds of this Winchester uh, supersonic ammo that we have in these magazines with the orange tape, and then we have 1,000 rounds of Winchester subsonic ammunition with the blue tape. And uh, so we're just gonna make sure the gun can cycle unsuppressed with both kinds of ammo, although arguably if you're shooting unsuppressed, you're probably gonna be running supersonic ammo because it makes more sense. But once we start running the suppressed version of this gun, provided it works, um, we will be shooting a lot of subsonic ammunition, especially tonight when it's dark, so it's not quite as loud. Um, so we have a little uh, firing schedule-ish thing, so of all the drills that we wanna shoot through, obviously subject to change, uh, but just to keep us on track so we can actually shoot a whole lot of rounds in one day. And the goal is basically uh, shoot this gun in one day to a round count that takes most guns owners one to two years so we're kind of expediting uh, seeing what kinds of problems might occur uh, with the gun but again this isn't a test um, we're just trying to gather some information for ourselves and our own curiosity I, I'm curious about this gun so 2,000 rounds in a day is pretty good we might hit like 1600 but hey that's not bad uh, for a single day because uh, a lot of folks just don't shoot that much out of their 300 blackout in a year um, so let's go ahead and uh, I've got we're gonna take a mag of supers and subs, make sure the gun doesn't explode uh, and that it can function, and then we're gonna go ahead and zero it. All right, I think we have a problem already uh, with the lower, most likely. So we noticed earlier that the mag release was already quite stiff um, due to some tolerance stuff going on. And it is definitely hanging up right here. So it's not fully engaging with the magazine. It's not recessing all the way into the lower. And this is a combination of this being a, I would imagine a Cerakoted arrow lower because we've had problems with that in the past. Um, and this being a PSA parts kit that might have some uh, improper tolerancing. So I think we're gonna, f I guess we're gonna file some of this away and get it to work. That works. Heard it click. We're set. All right, now to find out if the gun explodes. Okay. Kind of rode the charging handle there. All right, did not actually pick up a round. Or it did, okay. All right, sub seems to cycle when I'm you know, I have the gun actually pressed against my body. It's probably right on the verge of being able to work. So we're probably gonna just have to run supersonic ammo, but that's okay. Supers. That is quite a bit more. Injection is actually perfect uh, for supersonic ammo. So I think we're good to go. Gun didn't explode. Um, it is probably not going to cycle subs very reliably, uh, but on a gun like this, we're going to be shooting a lot of supers anyway. I will say though, that concussion, uh, shooting that for 500, 600 rounds, it's not great. Not great at all. All right, so we just shot two groups with the supersonic ammo and the sub ammo at 100 meters just to see roughly what the accuracy is. We're not in a lead sled, I just used bags, so there's some user error going on. Um, but we have essentially a four MOA, well, if you pull, pull one round out of the five round group, it's a four MOA-ish group with the supersonic ammo. If you add in that, it's, it's, a, it's a little bigger, like six MOA, which out of a seven inch barrel, I mean, it's not, terrible, um, to be honest. The sub subsonic ammo is actually a little bit tighter of a group. Um, and uh, again, if you pull four, it's still like four them away, uh, four squares uh, long. Um, we're a little shy of that. It's probably like 3.6 or something. So, um, but you can see the drop off uh, from the supersonic ammo with a 50 meter zero versus the subsonic ammo. It's all trending left a little bit. I'll probably do one click right just to refine my zero a little bit. Um, Cause even over here, it's off to the left slightly. But uh, pretty cool, so we can kind of see what this gun is doing. 
Um, not bad, to be honest. I'm actually pretty impressed with that. Um, it'll be fun to see uh, what changes when we throw the suppressor on, if that shrinks and gets a little bit better, or if it ends up just staying about the same. If it stays the same, I'm fine with that, but that'll be interesting. So now let's go shoot this gun uh, fast and see what it can do. Okay, little trigger freezer, 146. That was, only f that was 131. That's yet. A one, two, three. All right. So the supers are working pretty well. So that's like four build drills. We've got one, two, like seven yards. Five Charlies shooting pretty fast. That's six rounds in 1.2 seconds with this little shorty seven inch barrel 300 blackout. And um, it's recoiling more than a normal 5.56 gun, but uh, still very controllable. One fours, one sevens, one fives. Now let's try the subs. See how that does. Probably not gonna work at all. Yeah, it's just not moving fast enough to cycle the gun, which is fine to some extent. You know, that's why testing is important to know cool, this gun in this configuration with no suppressor, not gonna work with subsonic ammunition, or at least not this subsonic ammunition. So, this would be a dedicated supersonic only uh, build, which makes sense because I'm not shooting a suppressor. Um, I'd like to be able to shoot subs out of it because that's fun, but um, we can just stick to supers until we throw the can on and then it should cycle this just fine. So, because again, this has a proprietary buffer spring combo, so modifying this to cycle both ammos might be a little tricky. And then if we do that, the bolts will be moving too fast with the supers, and so in this case, I probably need to pick one and stick with it. And in this case, we'll just stick with the supersonic ammo and we'll save all this blue for uh, suppressor. First malfunction, besides the not cycling supers, it is a failure to extract. It's not coming out. I'm gonna have to pry this sucker. We'll need a screwdriver or multi-tool. Bullet is stuck. First malfunction of the day and we are like 240 rounds, 210. I don't know if it's a full, it's gotta be a casing, not a bullet. Did it come out? No. Very well. well. Oh wait, did you see if it was a casing or a bullet? I don't know. Oh, well, <laughs> it was a full bullet. It light striked. Well, it cycled, it went in, all right. It's not horrible, I guess.
So a couple uh, shootable things about this gun. The downside to PDW stocks is you don't usually get a whole lot of length of pull out of them. So you are gonna be choked up a little bit more on the gun than you normally might like. Because this is also a really short rail, that is just keeping me really tucked in, which is not, I can still get decent shooting performance, but it's not as optimal as having my arm a little bit further out where I can really control the gun a little bit better, not be all cramped up. Um, having a cramped up wrist also affects uh, trigger speed because you're just, your tendons and muscles are all much tighter. Um, so both of these things are going to affect some of the performance uh, in this gun when it comes to actually shooting it. So there is that. As soon as we swap to the suppressed, uh, with the rail with the suppressor, that should help even in being a little more evened out because uh, then I can have this hound hand a little bit further out. Yes, I'll still be choked up a little bit, but it'll be a little more comfortable. So having a straighter grip would also help. Uh, this is just the A2 that came with the lower parts kit. We're gonna, we might change it when we go back and you know, put the suppressor on the gun. Um, so that, this would be one thing I would change right now that would improve, would actually improve trigger speed, speed believe it or not. Um, just having a more natural angle on the wrist. But I am still getting one four splits with this, so it is doable. I guess the upper is full auto rated. And that's my first time ever shooting through in a blackout full auto. It does move a little bit, not gonna lie. Just a little bit. Okay, PSA, okay, okay. All right. All right, so we're back in the armory to build this out in the suppressed configuration, but we got this to around 575 rounds um, with these uh, supers. We were not shooting subs because it would not cycle uh, with this particular buffer spring combo um, and with the upper in its current state. My theory is once we uh, add the suppressor, it will be cycling the subs just fine, but it might be a little spicy with the supersonic ammo, but we'll probably be shooting a lot more subs anyway because we have, um, we still have a thousand rounds of that to shoot. Um, so let's go ahead and open up what we've got. So we have the Griffin GP7. Uh, this is a direct thread suppressor. Uh, it's in that $575 sort of range. So it's not that super budget 300. It's not that thousand dollar sort of $900 where most suppressors are. It's kind of in the middle. And um, what's cool about this can is it is a direct thread. So you're eliminating the need for a muzzle device. So you're saving a little bit of weight, um, but they also have a handy little uh, hole here uh, that makes pin and welding this to a barrel a little bit easier. And the reason you might want to do that if you're putting this on say a, like a, a nine inch upper 10 inch up or something like that, um, I think this is like 6.75 inches, is uh, if it's meet 16 inches or over 16 inches, uh, it's only a one stamp, uh, technically, a firearm. It won't be an SBR, it is a suppressor only uh, stamp, uh, which we have an upper from YHM uh, that is built like that. Um, so some folks are doing that just to minimize the whole SBR thing so they can still run a stock and all that. Um, we're not gonna be doing that on this gun, we're just gonna direct thread it and uh, put it on properly. Um, doesn't weigh too much, which is nice, and it's also slender enough that when I take the Griffin, I don't know what the name of the rail is. A, I think it's the rigid something. Um, it will actually fit inside of this rail. It is a very tight fit, um, but it will function and it will work. And uh, it should maintain the barrel being free floated. Um, I, I could probably torque the rail enough that it'll touch the suppressor and affect my point of impact, but it should be okay. So it's essentially gonna look something like, based on the barrel length, something like this. 
and this will just give me a little bit more space for uh, lasers, a little more space for my hand, kind of like I talked about earlier for better ergonomics. Um, but there'll be a couple little things that come in uh, with the suppressor so close to the rail, I won't be able to mount accessories on the M-Lock next to the suppressor itself. So I'll still have to run a lot of my stuff back here. Uh, but we'll talk about that once the gun is built. And so that's what's gonna bring this gun up to that $1,500 uh, sort of area with the can. So it's definitely a uh, budget, pretty budget. I, I mean, you could definitely, you could go a little cheaper, you know, with, uh, you know, getting a cheaper suppressor, but it's not really something I would recommend on a gun like this, uh, especially if you're doing like an integrally suppressed thing. Uh, we've got some rail covers and uh, we're gonna go ahead and build this out. And then we're gonna talk about accessories, uh, optics, and we're gonna take a couple options out to the range to test uh, and get some opinions on. All right, so the upper is built and this thing is pretty slick. Uh, this is definitely like, I, I shoot a lot of MCX, uh, MCX rifles suppressed with the SD rail going over the can and it is pretty girthy, pretty wide, pretty thick, multiple Cs. Um, this is pretty slim. Uh, there's a 1.5 inch diameter on the inside. So this is one of the larger, fatter M-Lock rails on the market. Uh, but as you can see, it just really uh, keeps that suppressor uh, nice and tucked away, but it's still you know nice and slim if you do like you know slimmer hand guards. I don't mind the ones that are a little bit wider like the MCX, but this is pretty nice. Uh, this is actually very close to the new Wrist 3, so that's pretty cool. But like I mentioned earlier, all these M-Lock slots up front are unusable. Um, your bolt and nut is going to, it's just not going to engage with the uh, M-Lock slot at all. Uh, so those are completely unusable. The only thing that's usable right here is the rail section on the top for a front sight post uh, for an IR laser, which we will be using because we'll be shooting with night vision tonight. Um, so we do have that. I can also run my hand out a little bit further. So that's pretty cool. Um, so let's go ahead and see what this looks like with the lower. ACOG, we'll try the ACOG. Um, so yeah, so uh, that's a pretty tight fit, but that's all right. Um, so yeah, that's what we've got right now. And it is uh, Honey Badger-esque, or ish. And uh, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. That should be a little bit easier to shoot, being able to get my hand out a little bit further, like I talked about earlier. Uh, let's go ahead and see what the weight is. I'm actually curious, where's the scale? Uh, right here. This will be unloaded with no accessories because that's um, obviously very subjective. But the weight is six pounds, 12.7 ounces. So I believe this is a little bit on the heavier end compared to some 300 blackouts out there. Uh, we were comparing some of the weight to the Rattler. This is a longer barrel, but it is a little bit heavier and some of that is, or a lot of that is just due to the stock um, of the rifle. It's a little chonkier and beefier, but it does allow for a very good cheek weld. So now we've got to figure out what accessories are we going to be running on uh, this guy. And I think what we're actually going to start with is an ACOG uh, because I'm interested in seeing how far we can take this guy out there. This is a uh, 300 blackout ACOG. It actually has a BDC reticle uh, for supersonic ammo and subsonic ammo. Um, so having a little 4X should allow us to take the gun out to two, 300 meters pretty effortlessly. That's about how far I'd want to shoot 300 blackout. Uh, could it go to 400? Probably, but not necessarily the point of this gun. Um, and then we're going to pop this sucker off and go to a two dot EOTech. Uh, this is the 300 blackout EOTech that actually, again, has two dots, one for supersonic ammo, one for subsonic. Uh, you zero the top for supers and it gives you your hold on the bottom for subs if you're constantly swapping back and forth. Uh, cool product, really only useful for 300 blackout and you have the little diagram here on the top showing your zero uh, and your distances and it's top dot for supersonic ammo point of aim point of impact 50 meters uh, which will be 100 meters for subs you know 50 meters for supers and then the bottom dot is 150 uh, meters or in this case it says yards but 150 yards for the bottom dot for supers and it's 300 yards for subs so you could lob them if need be so that's pretty cool. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with the uh, ACOG and then we're gonna go to the fore end, add a light, add a laser and talk through some of that. So 
So for the IR laser, we're gonna be using the L3 at PLC. There are a ton of these out there on the market. Yes, there's other lasers that can outperform it, such as the Mall um, or even the uh, D-Ball D2, and there's some other offerings coming out soon, which I'm very excited about. Um, but there are some things about this laser that I really like. It is uh, very consistent, uh, holds zero very well, and it's also lightweight, which I really appreciate. And it doesn't have a uh, battery drain, or at least not that I've witnessed, uh, even if you leave the laser on in the on position, but not like on, on. Um, so it is a very reliable laser and it's lightweight. So we're gonna position this. There's a fire button directly on top. Uh, this rail is skinny enough that I could actually just rely on the fire button and not run a tape switch, which I might do on this build, um, but I might run the tape switch as a backup. Um, but activating this, if we swap to viz mode, yeah, see that is very intuitive. And then we could run our white light switch uh, right here in the back. Um, so we'll play around, we'll see uh, what might be nice. Um, but to be honest, this is more of sort of a dedicated night vision build because it is 300 blackout, I'm gonna be shooting subs. So I wanna, I'm gonna be prioritizing laser setup on this gun. So it may still just be a tape switch um, here in the back and then we'll just position the laser a little bit farther forward to make room for that. So we've got our laser positioning figured out. Uh, we'll add some Velcro to where the tape switches are gonna go, but we gotta figure out where to put the, the white light. Um, I like to prioritize white lights on the left side, especially if I'm running a backup switch um, for redundancy, uh, such as the Surefire uh, DS00 that has a uh, push cap clicky button in case your pressure switch dies, because disconnected, falls off the rifle. I still have a way of activating uh, that light. So I'm gonna be running that on the left side of the gun. It also keeps the weight more in, uh, centered with my hand versus being on the right side. Uh, again, it kind of depends on the size of rifle you're using on what you're, you know, what you're doing. But um, the issue here with this setup is with the standard pro mount of this Surefire uh, Mini Light, uh, I can't utilize the M-Lock up here at the front, so my light's gonna be positioned way back here. And this is where a uh, weapon light attachment system, uh, such as our light bar, really comes into play on a rifle like this, or something like the Unity Fusion Hub, uh, where the light can actually pass around the laser and kind of get further forward. Um, but we're gonna use the light bar because that should push the light up a little bit further. Not necessarily in line with the suppressor, but definitely further. And so it's just gonna candy lever the light outwards, and that can be positioned out here, and that'll look pretty slick. All right, so we've got our light pushed further forward, exactly what we want, so we're a little bit closer to uh, the suppressor, so that is really nice, um, really like that. And now we could run a push cap, but it's getting a little far out there for uh, activating seamlessly, so we're gonna run the ST07 pressure switch here on the side, and we're going to maintain our uh, laser switch at 12 o'clock on the top. And then this gun, uh, we're gonna throw an armor on top, is ready to get back out there to zero, group, and then shoot. And uh, we'll also zero the EOTech, and we'll pop them on and off and swap between them. All right, first round pop, nice, nice. Okay. Feels good. Uh, real good, actually. Um, for a suppressed 300 blackout, very nice. Supersonic. Seem to cycle fine. Jeez, that that's that's quite a bit. Quite a bit of gas, as you can see. Um, so later we'll throw in the Raptor SD charging handle, see if we can tame that a little bit. Because yeah, I can already tell if I'm shooting like a 10 round course of fire or sh string, I will definitely be crying by the end of it with the supersonic. Well, that's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and zero. We're gonna zero the EOTech first and then the ACOG. All right, so we're done shooting the groups with the suppressor and the ACOG. So we have, we're running this with a 4X, which is all, makes it a little bit easier than when we shot this with the EOTech. Um, but we're actually getting about the same uh, groups. With the uh, supersonic ammo, we're still getting like a four to five inch group at 100 meters. If we take best four, we're looking at three ammo away ish which is not horrible for a seven inch barrel uh, with a can on it. Uh, so we're gonna go out to distance and see what we can do. Uh, with the subsonic ammo, we actually dropped about twice as much as when we were shooting it unsuppressed. Um, the group when we shot unsuppressed was around in this region right here, and with the suppressor, it is all the way down here. Uh, the group has appeared, at least in best four, if you want to take best four, um, is actually much tighter, uh, like two MOA, um, compared to when we shot it earlier and it was like a three. 
So pretty interesting. The twist rate on here is obviously going to favor one of the two ammos uh, with a one in five uh, twist. And it does appear to be favoring the subsonic ammo, both suppressed and unsuppressed. But with a barrel length of, uh, you know, seven inch barrel length, this is not horrible. There's five, five, six guns there, 16 inch that are doing this. Uh, so the fact that we're doing this with a seven inch barrel, uh, not horrible, but take that information for what it is. And uh, I am still shooting it off of some bags with a mil spec trigger. Uh, there's some things we could optimize to get a better group, but we're just working with what we've got right now. So, but useful information. Now we're gonna go shoot distance and see what we can do using both uh, supersonic and uh, subsonic and uh, using the BDC holds inside of the SACOG and see what we can do at distance. Whoa, impact. That, that was an impact. Hey Luke. Yeah, just having too much Luke. <laughs> oh, the yes. card ran out of space. Yeah. I didn't get any of that. And you get two shots off before the first one impacts. <laughs> All right. Oh, oh no! No function. Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm watching every single one, and it looks like it's going off to the left. And bing. This is hot. Where are you holding? On the, uh, so there's a 150 mark, and then it's the one right underneath for 200. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Supers, though, I'm holding on the six for the four, but I did just have a malfunction of some sort. Ugh. So write that down. Write that down. What? I just got to click when it should have been a bang. All right, let's swap charging handle. Oh, you have the radiant. Get rid of that piece of crap. So that's plus 120 bucks. 120. Not horrible. Who knows though? All right. Still, yeah, there's a ton right here. Just more than an MCX, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. We'll keep running the radiant. Definitely helps. So we're done with the ACOG and the RMR combo. Uh, taking it out to distance was pretty fun, especially with the subs. Um, this does seem to be a little bit more accurate with the subs, um, shooting out to 200, uh, lots of good hits. That was a lot of fun. Um, but now we're gonna swap this out for something that's probably a little more suitable for this build. Uh, and that's gonna be this EOTech uh, 300 blackout reticle, which we talked about earlier. And as you can see, it has this nice little infographic that shows you, in case you forget, which most people will if they don't shoot this gun super often, um, exactly where to hold, uh, how to zero, and which dot will do what with which ammo. Um, so we're just gonna pop this sucker off, and that should return to zero with the kinetic development uh, switch. I can't remember what the name of those things are. Um, but it's a quick detached riser, 5 eighths riser, which brings this up to that 200, 204 height, something like that, uh, with the absolute coat in a COTEC. <clears throat> so that should work pretty well, especially for shooting with nods. And I found that when you're shooting with um, PDW stocks uh, or, or like wire stocks, um, having an optic that gets your head up a little bit off of it uh, can actually be a little bit helpful uh, as far as comfort over time. Less necessary on a standard stock, 
So I like having this raised up a little bit on this build. So it indexes, pops out, and that should, should have returned to zero. So we'll shoot a little confirmation group and double check. But now we've lightened the gun considerably and it should be maybe a little faster. All right, so we just hit 2,000 rounds shot through all of our boxes of ammo that we brought out here <clears throat> out of this uh, budget honey badger. And I know it's not an actual honey badger, and I'm sure some of you uh, Q fanboys or AAC fanboys are gonna say, there's no way this is an actual honey badger. The barrel's not the right length, the suppressor's wrong, it's not long enough, the rail's not proper, the gun's not all silver. The, the, the honey badger is simply a term I'm using for an integrally suppressed 300 blackout rifle that is honey badger Ask. So, but y'all can debate in the comments, that's fine. Um, overall, I'm quite impressed with this gun. Uh, it survived 2,000 rounds. We didn't have any major issues. Uh, the stock came loose a few times, and then finally we were able to tighten it down enough that it stopped moving on us. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, the first sort of uh, big issue I guess we had was the suppressor coming loose uh, after we finished shooting at the long range, uh, doing some of that with the ACOG. Um, but then we uh, tightened it down past the uh, manufacturer's recommendation and it didn't move after that even with the full auto fire and the other like 1200 rounds we ended up shooting afterwards um, it has not moved and um, not to say it may not move you know it may move in the future but we really have no idea um, remember this is not a test we only shot 2000 minus there's some loose rounds on the ground so like probably a dozen or so so you know 19 you know 80 something or whatever but uh this is not a test but it was just interesting to see um, what we could do with this gun in 2000 because this is usually about the amount of rounds I'm shooting through guns in the armory to get a feel for them and usually what that looks like is I shoot 300 or 400 rounds through that particular configuration and then I you know wait a week until the next time we film or I go train with it another three four hundred rounds and it's about a month and a half long process before I have the gun and I go Yep, I know what's going on with it. I have a decent idea of what's going on, what to expect. Uh, but I just did that in, it, in one single day for this gun. So when this gun goes back to the armory, if we leave it in this, uh, this configuration, um, I know what, I'm, what it's going to feel like when I pick this up to shoot it again and some of the nuances. Like there's some uh, hang up with the bolt and this particular stock. Um, you know, when you're going to charge it, it's kind of hard and then all of a sudden it slips and pops. Um, probably something to do with some of the tolerances back here. Uh, so that's a little thing I picked up on, you know, spending some time on this. And just the uh, recoil impulse of the gun shooting subs. Now, for those of you that are interested in getting a 300 blackout, whether you're getting something like this or uh, an MCX or some of the other offerings out there, um, a lot of folks out there, you know, they don't want to get into it because the ammo is expensive. This is true, it is quite expensive. However, uh, because this is an AR-15 pattern rifle, you do not have to shoot it or train with it as often as your normal AR-15 and 5.56. In fact, shooting subsonic ammo out of this gun, whether it's suppressed or unsuppressed, is easier. There's less recoil. It's much smoother uh, than shooting a 5.56 rifle. Uh, so like, I'm not training with 300 blackout all the time to stay current on my 300 blackouts. All my training shooting 5.56 guns 
carries over. So after you buy a 300 blackout, you know, something like this, definitely spend some time, 500 rounds, possibly a thousand rounds. I mean, the more you can do, the better. A thousand rounds to learn the gun, you know, uh, confirm your zero often, uh, make sure nothing's, you know, changing, your suppressor's not getting loose on you. Uh, you kind of need some round count for that. Uh, but once you've gotten that squared away, you don't have to shoot it every week. You can keep shooting your 5.56 guns, which are much cheaper. And then as soon as you pick this guy up, well, look, it's exactly the same, has pretty much all the same parts. I can even mirror all the same parts, uh, you know, same laser, same light, same optic, same bad lever, same trigger, same everything. Um, so overall, pretty cool gun. We're going to keep shooting this and seeing what happens. Um, but I'm impressed. Now, uh, it actually shot really well. This is a little bit on the heavier end compared to our MCXs and some of the other guns that we have. Um, but you know, a lot of it probably comes down to the stock, but it's also a little bit more balanced than the MCXs. They're a little more front heavy uh, because of their little little stocks that they have going on. So overall, uh, very cool little build. Suppressor did well. Uh, had some first round pop flash, but that's generally fairly normal, um, but it is a $575 can. So very impressive for what it's done. But again, it's only 2000 rounds. Um, you know, potentially in 3000 rounds, we'd have some major issues that we just aren't really seeing. Uh, the rail could come really loose and twist and spin and just other stuff could fall apart. A firing pin could break. We did actually lube this gun like three times, um, but lube isn't necessarily going to break a firing pin or, you know, or not. So, um, so yeah, but again, if you guys are interested in buying a rifle like this, the reason I recommend people looking into these is there's a lot of folks out there, some of you all watching this right now, who may own six 5.56 rifles, 10 5.56 rifles that are all roughly the same barrel length, give or take a couple inches, 13.7, a 14.5, a 16. Maybe they all have the same type of optic. And to be honest, all those guns do the exact same thing. Uh, what we've been recommending for the past couple years, and we're gonna be pushing some more content on this year, is uh, diversify your arsenal uh, or just the equipment that you have. Think about a small bag gun that's a little bit more concealable uh, that probably is in a 300 blackout caliber or even nine millimeter that's a little bit more effective than a little 75 556 gun which isn't that great and then you have your standard carbine your 13.7 14.5 that's got your lpvo or your acog that's like your sort of do all rifle uh, infantry carbine and then your designated marksman rifle your bolt gun whatever it happens to be if you're going that route uh, but that's will give you a lot more capability than owning six guns that are all the same which i often see with gun owners uh, they think being more prepared is buying a lot of the same gun and that's really only useful if you want to use them as currency or you want to arm um, a group of people for uh, some reason. So uh, just a couple things to think about. Little gun like this, pretty cool option for that you know, small sub gun, bag gun uh, category. And then you have your 5.56 rifle as your main infantry type gun. And then your designated marksman rifle, your SCAR, your, you know, your bull gun or whatever. And uh, we will be talking more about that stuff in the future. So hope that video was helpful guys. Um, but remember training is key. We say that in every video. Uh, but the only reason I'm able to run out here and shoot all these drills uh, consistently, uh, whether it's with full auto, uh, supersonic ammo, which does recoil more than 5.56 is uh, just running very basic reps, knowing how to handle a firearm. Uh, you don't have to do a bunch of crazy stuff. You don't have to do big kitchen sink drills. Uh, little simple drills, isolating out the mechanics is what's gonna allow you to execute at a high standard consistently when you are put up to shoot a run and gun stage or something a little bit more complicated. So uh, stay safe and we will see you guys next time. Very cool. <coughs> That's the MCX. Rear blackout, full auto, with subsonic ammunition, and a little shorty dead air suppressor. And my lead levels have now just gone up, probably one whole point. <laughs>